John chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman therefore said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water shall thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are really appreciative for your word. You teach us so much if we just pay attention. We're thankful, Lord, for not only the promise that Jesus gave here in John chapter 4 of that living water, but the fulfillment of that shortly thereafter, following his death, resurrection, ascension, when he sent the Spirit. Father, we truly are blessed people to live in this time, in this place, under the terms of the new covenant, with the helper, the spirit to dwell within us. Lord, you have given us so much. I ask that you be with me today as I preach your word, that I would communicate it clearly, and that each of us, Father, would consider what you have given to us. We would wrap our minds around that, and that our faith, Lord, would catch up to the spiritual reality that you have of your spirit dwelling within. May you be glorified. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, you know, just a few things. I'm looking around this room, and most of us, I know, are, are very familiar and have thought through quite a bit under the new covenant, the indwelling spirit. You know, from a doctrinal, logical perspective, I think most of us understand that. And that itself, brother, we are amazingly blessed. You find, again, some extremes. You find the whole, I'll just kind of lump it this way, the Pentecostal movement, all sorts of false teaching and false hope in reference to the Holy Spirit. And then you have the, I'll just say, conservative Church of Christ over here that's afraid to touch it because of the confusion over there. God's clear about in reference to the Holy Spirit. And I'm thankful for that. Again, most of us, we understand, I think, doctrinally, logically. But I want you to, with me, consider these things uh, today. You know, how many of you have found that in this life, in your pursuits, let's, let's put aside the spiritual for a second, you're in this life, in your pursuits, that... You can't find any satisfaction. Anybody find that? I'm going to go back to Josiah's example for a second. A lot of the things that are tasty, like ice cream. It's an amazing thing with something like ice cream, high sugar content, very tasty. But what happens when you eat that? Well, your insulin spikes, and shortly thereafter, you are extremely hungry. If, in other words, if you eat high-carb diet that's the wrong kind of carbs, you are going to be hungry all the time. That's just the way it works. In a spiritual sense, if you are pursuing the things of the flesh, you are never going to have satisfaction. Matter of fact, what you're going to want is something more and more and more that never can give you what you want. Amazing thing about that. And so Jesus promises something here. He says, what I'm going to give you, you shall never thirst. I I like that promise, and I want us to think about that a little bit today as we go through this. Another thing, I'm not preaching on this today, but I do want you to notice something about the character of Jesus. Jesus is neither racist 
nor sexist. Okay. Not, I'm not going to preach a bunch on that today, but I want you to notice something. Jesus sees every individual as an eternal soul. Here the disciples go off to get food. Here a Samaritan woman is. And Jesus strikes up a conversation with her. Actually asks her to do something for him. Give me a drink. She's shocked by that. What are you, a Jew, first of all doing talking to me? I'm a Samaritan. She doesn't touch the, the woman issue there and her question to Jesus. But both of those things are actually surprising. Jesus values this woman. The Samaritan woman as an eternal soul. We're not going to follow through in John chapter 4. Hopefully many of you read this this last week. But you see the results. This is a way that the whole door of the gospel is opening up into that Samaritan world for the future. Because Jesus cared about this woman. We are all sorts of pressure in weird ways in our world today. I was a number of years ago. Um, Matthew and I had a friend. He was a, a captain, a pilot for Delta. And one of the things he said, he's I've, I've had friends, and particularly he was talking about in reference to black. He said, I've had black friends, fellow workers my whole life. He's like, I've never been racist, but he's like, this, all this stuff about the race, it's almost turning me into racist. Well, that's the, stra that's the, that's the goal, to drive a wedge. We're living in a world where that wedge is just absolutely being driven. Matter of fact, it's strange to me, but one of the things you're not allowed to say is... If you say, I don't see color, well, that's, that's white privilege. No. You aren't supposed to see color. You aren't supposed to see male or female. You're supposed to see an eternal soul. That's how Jesus lives, lived his life on earth. That's how he is, male and female, both made in his image. That's who God is. That's who we should follow his example. Not preaching on that day. I just wanted to put that out. Yeah, I, what I'm saying is, I love Jesus. Every single way that he conducts himself, he conducts himself perfectly. The character of God. This is who he's making us to be. A few points that I want to hit today. Living water is the indwelling spirit. The spirit renews Transform, strengthens us. Sometimes people say, well, what's the Spirit do for the Christian? That's a good question. He does renew us. He transforms us, strengthens us. He helps us to crucify the flesh, and he gives us life. And this is just scratching the surface of what the Spirit does. I, I already don't know how many examples, illustrations I'm going to have time for in this today, because there's, so, you know, sometimes you, you're getting together stuff for a message, and you've got so much, and you just got to start throwing away papers of notes. In you know, these were mental notes, but... There's so much the Spirit does. These are some things I've just chosen to hit on today. And one other thing I want you to notice, Jesus does, had told the Samaritan woman, if you would have known, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him. And he would have given you living water. So asking Jesus is something I want to hit also at the end. So what's, what is this living water that Jesus promised to give? Well, we don't just want to throw it out there. Let's look at the scripture. John chapter 7. Kind of came up in our class this morning. Adult Bible school class. Stick with stuff you can prove. I like that. There are all sorts of speculations and conjectures that people come up with. I always like a, a book, chapter, and verse, right? So book, chapter, and verse. What is this living water? I, before we do this. How many of you have had interactions with people who think they're Christians? If you were to ask, and have had this conversation with them, if you were to ask people who think they're Christians, what is living water? What, what's their response almost always going to be? They might think about it for a second. They might say, I don't know. But most of them are going to think it's salvation. Okay. Some, sort of, some sort of picture of forgiveness of sins. What is the scripture? How does the scripture define this living water? John chapter 7, verse 37. Now on, that, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If any man is thirsty, 
let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus defines for us, the scripture defines for us what Jesus is talking about, what these rivers of living water are. The Holy Spirit. Now, particularly, we can even get a little something here from this path. Well, there's a put in scripture together. The fact that the spirit wasn't yet given because Jesus wasn't yet glorified is going to bring you down to one thing scripturally, and that is the indwelling spirit. And there's also some hints from both this passage in John 7 and John 4. In John 7, he says, from his innermost being shall flow. That's something from within. That's going to be indwelling spirit. Back there in John chapter 4, Jesus' discussion with the woman at the well. In him, it's going to be this well of water. Okay, so you see the picture of, of the indwelling spirit of God. I'm really thankful for this definition of the scripture from the New Testament perspective. All of a sudden now, there's a lot of things in the Old Testament that are going to come alive for you when you realize what prophecies are talking about ministry of the Holy Spirit. So, really thankful for that. I'm not preaching on that today. I'm just going to key in on some of, these, uh, some of the benefits that we have of having this indwelling Spirit. The indwelling Holy Spirit is the mystery that is hidden in the Old Testament. Colossians 1 makes that clear. The mystery, the riches of the mystery, the glory of Christ, which is Christ in you. The mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. is hidden from past ages and generations. The clues are there in the Old Testament, but nobody really would have been able to figure it out until the author goes back and connects the dots of what those clues were. The mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the promise of the New Testament. Lots of times when the scripture speaks about the promise... When the, when the scripture speaks of the promise, he's speaking of the spirit. I'm just going to hit one passage on that really quick. Again, I want to, we, we do always want to come back to the scripture. Let the scripture define terms for us. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having become a curse for us, for it's written... Curses everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. A number of other New Testament scriptures that drive home that point. Just picked one for the sake of time. The promise that God is giving to us the indwelling Spirit. I, I even like how Jesus told the woman at the well, if you knew the gift of God, there's a gift that God wants to give. Okay? The promise of the indwelling spirit. Kind of touched on this already, but I want to drive this home too. The indwelling spirit only available under the new covenant. Go with me to Matthew chapter 11. Well, you guys know this. We, we'll save, t save time and just talk about it. So, How often do you hear people saying this, or you've thought it yourself, and maybe every once in a while you even still say it, man, it would have been great to be back there during that time when the, the nation of Israel, God put those ten plagues on Egypt and led them out and had them cross through the Red Sea. They saw the waters part. They saw those waters come crashing over and, and wipe out that whole Egyptian army in the Red Sea. Oh man, wouldn't it have been great to, to be back there while Jesus was alive on earth. To be down there at the Jordan River, hanging on every word that he said. And to be, when John says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. To be one of those guys that say, uh, come up behind Jesus. Jesus says, hey, what, what, do, you, what do you see? And he told him, what? Where are you staying? He says, come and see. Like, we'd be one of those people. Wouldn't that have been great to be there? Guys, we got something way better. We flat out have something better. Be two, two reasons. First of all, we can make that trek with Jesus, and we need to. Anytime we want to, we make that trek. How many of you have ever had an experience, you went somewhere, a vacation, whatever, it was a really great time, 
But over time, the memories start to fade a little bit. We can make the same trek. Be there on the ground with Jesus, and we can go back and we can review that and remember it, and it's like real time. That's one reason. But the real reason it's better is because during that time, there was no indwelling Spirit of God. Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, Jesus speaking about John the Immerser. And this guy, recently Mr. J. Wilson preached a great message, the Lord will commend those who do not bend, right? John was a guy, zero bend to that guy. I do think about Mr. J. Wilson. One thing I admire very much about him, that guy has got zero bend to him. Sometimes you feel it even when you give him a hug. It's like a hugging an oak tree, just boom. And spiritually, no bend. I, that's the kind of guy John was. Sometimes the movies and stuff, they portray John as some sort of crazy guy. Is that, you know, he wore some weird stuff. But you don't build that, all that momentum because you're some nutcase down there on the street corner. Okay. This guy had courage. He, you looking for a reed shaken by the wind? That ain't John. John going to stand. Okay. You looking for a man dressed in soft clothing? The guy who's rolling up in his Rolls Royce, that ain't John. You looking for a prophet? Yeah. Jesus said, one who's even more than a prophet, right? This is the guy who's coming. That God looked throughout history and he said, I want this guy to pave the way for the coming Christ. So Jesus says... He says, truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John. I can believe that. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets. Run those through your mind. None of them greater than John. God picked the best of the best to do this. And then the last part of this, Jesus says, he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. How many of you heard that before? Yeah, we all heard that. Let it sink in for a second, though. The least Christian is greater than John. This is how much God values you. To live in this time, in this place, under the new covenant. Why is that? Jesus says, among those born of women, there's not arisen anyone greater than John. We've been born again. Born not of blood, nor the flesh, nor the will of man. We've been born of God. And with that, well, let's go to Hebrews 11. Under this new covenant... Hebrews 11, verse 39, talking about all the faithful men and women of that Old Testament. Hebrews 11, 39, all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Literally, did not receive the promise. Because God had provided something better for us, so that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. None of them had the indwelling Holy Spirit. They had great faith. They didn't have the indwelling spirit. This is worth stopping and thinking about what God has done for us, what he has given to us, the living water available only under the new covenant. And so what are some things that the spirit does for us? Well, one great thing the spirit does for us, well, let's just ask this question. What would you expect living water to do? How many have ever been to Chico Hot Springs? I don't know what all the other hot springs are in Montana. There's a bunch of them. Julie found this place one time. We're heading on the way to Missoula, and you just pull off the side of the road, jump out, go, and this nice little hot springs. You can do a little cliff jumping even. I chose not to do that one, that part of it. The rest of the family did. But uh, anyways, that's another, I'm a little more cautious in those things. But what do they always say about hot springs? 
What are some things that everybody likes to go to the hot springs for besides the comfort? Healing. Right? And there's some supposed I don't know if there's any healing or not. I've never found any benefit. Maybe if I jumped off the cliff, I'd find more. I don't know. But, you know, the healing properties of it. The, the, the life-giving, the refreshing, the healing, the strengthening, etc. What about, uh, was it Ponce de Leon who was looking for the fountain of youth? keep you alive forever. None. You aren't going to find any healing waters in a physical sense that's going to let you live forever. But we would expect living water to do these things, wouldn't we? The Spirit does renew us. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Titus chapter 3, I'm just going to pick it up in the middle of this sentence. Verse 5, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. He saved us. When we were immersed into Christ, that's the washing of regeneration. The renewing, though, of the Spirit. Brethren, I won't ask for a show of hands today. How many of you have been immersed into Christ for the right reasons? A lot of us have been. You have the opportunity today, because of the renewing of the Holy Spirit, to be just as new today. As the day you came up out of the waters of your immersion. Just as new today. Clean slate. One number, and, and you're actually, if, if you understand this right, you're way better off. Because if you've been a Christian for a while, you've got starting to get some actual habits of righteousness in line with that. But the newness, without any of the old bad. I'm thankful for that renewing. That's a great thing. Every day, every moment of the day, the Spirit. It's a, I don't know, I heard Matthew say this, but I have a feeling he might have stolen it from my dad. The Spirit continually renews your subscription on eternal life. I like that. Anybody remember the old antivirus subscriptions? I have a Mac now, so I don't worry about it. Uh, but, but what is the, all these new antivirus stuff, isn't it like continual live update, renewal, re, I don't know how that works. Andy, am I kind of right? No, nah, no. Nah. The Holy Spirit is that, okay? He renews us continually. Okay? Our, our subscription on eternal life and makes us new inside. That's awesome. Guys, where are you going to get that? Did they have that under the Old Testament? You go put yourself under that law, trying to do the right thing, trying to please God. Every time you fall short, what you got to go through to remember your failures, boom. Boom, boom. The separation between you and God. Feeling that every single time. The Holy Spirit, he renews us in Christ. Thankful for that. The times of refreshing that we have. You know, Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and Acts 3, 19 are parallel. When you put these verses side by side, they're parallel. And when Acts 2, 38 talks about the indwelling spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 3, 19, this phrase there, is times of refreshing that come from the presence of the Lord. That's who the Spirit is. He brings, he refreshes us, brings us times of refreshing. Here's an example that I think of. Montana, boy, with winters like this last one. Go to Ghana, West Africa. You're out there in Ghana, West Africa, hot and humid and, frankly, miserable. Right? Michelle is like, you spent a number, you spent an extensive time over there. Uh, I hate to mix metaphors today because of what Josiah was saying, but I'll tell you what, an orange soda never looked so good to me. Hot, humid, thirsting to death. I mean, that's what it feels like. And a cold. 
I don't even like orange soda. That orange soda. Something cold, something that can refresh me. Rivers, is in this life, guys, doesn't it suck the life in the physical existence? It's like a desert out there. Hot, humid, whatever. Take your pick. Sucking the life out of you. The spirit, times of refreshing. Way better than any, what do they sell there? Fresca or something? Is there orange soda? I don't remember. But anyways, times of, re- I'm thankful for that from the Lord. The spirit renews our inner man. This is an interesting thing. The terminology in scripture is so consistent. We have a responsibility to not to be conformed to this world, but be, to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, right? Whose responsibility is it to renew your mind? It's yours. The Holy Spirit is not going to renew your mind for you. Okay? You can put your Bible under your pillow at night or use it as a pillow if you want to. And the Holy Spirit is not going to import this into you. He won't do that for you. The Holy Spirit is not going to put in the work to change your thinking. We have a responsibility to renew our mind. Do you know what the Spirit does? He the, the scripture is clear in these other passages. We are being renewed. Our inner man is being renewed day by day. We are being renewed in the spirit of our mind. The spirit is actually doing a work of, re, as we renew our minds, the spirit is doing a work of renewal in the inner man. A supernatural work. I really loved the the class today just thinking about the flood and what God did through those flood waters and bringing about a whole really a new creation a new world and it's absolutely amazing what's God doing inside of us isn't he creating us according to the likeness we're, we're being changed to the likeness of him who created us okay, righteousness holiness of the truth the spirit's doing work within us to renew us to that the spirit along these same lines spirit transforms us let's go to second corinthians chapter three second corinthians three verses 17 and 18 now the lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the lord is there is liberty aren't you thankful the new covenant the law of liberty, the ministry of the Spirit. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. So again, I will reiterate this. We have a responsibility to behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. The Holy Spirit is your co-pilot, he's not your autopilot. I'm thankful. Holy Spirit's in there. We, we talked a little about, about, came up class today, where Satan entered into Judas. There is demonic possession. There is not Holy Spirit possession. There's Holy Spirit indwelling. Aren't you thankful for that? Holy Spirit never takes away your free will, your choice. It's not the way God operates. Really, really thankful for that. So the Spirit is not going to do your responsibility for you. Our responsibility to behold is in a mirror the glory of the Lord. But who does the transforming work here? Just as from the Lord, the Spirit. I like the analogy Mr. J. Wilson has used in the New Creation booklet of taking the picture, developing the picture, and then gazing at the picture. So I just want you to, to think about this for a moment as we're being transformed in the image of the glorified Christ. If, if you're, I'll just say as a side note, if you're still veiled, you aren't going to see the glorified Christ. So you're going to get the wrong picture. You're not going to get, you're not going to ever be changed in the likeness of Christ. But when we're beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord with the unveiled face, we're getting a picture. The light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. I know it's amazing now. We pull out our cell phone, you stabilize it, helps to stabilize it. Okay. You take a picture. The more stable it is, the clearer the picture. That's just for all of you old folks out there, me included. Uh, 
So, but it spits it back. What, what happens there? Well, the old school taking the picture was a little more of a, you could understand the process a little bit, right? So there is, you know, photosensitivity. It's, it's sensitive, like light has something to do with every step along the way. Well, that's a, that's a cool image, the light of, G, of the glorified Christ. But along with that, there's some pretty complicated chemistry. And I think about that complicated chemistry in the development of it. So in the olden days, you first of all get a latent image. What does that mean? That means the image is there, but it's not visible. There is a process here, brother. For that latent image, there has to be some chemistry taking place. I'm just going to say, it's, people ask, well, how does that work? Well, ask Jay Wilson next Sunday morning. On that, and ask Jay, I mean, uh, Bible school class. Okay? But that chemistry, here's the way that works. How's the spirit do it? He work in some internal chemistry. And if you will, if I can take this analogy a little bit, there's a latent image. What that means is that image is there, but it is not visible. There's more chemistry, and then that latent image becomes a visible image. This is the way it's going to work in our life. We have a responsibility to behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. There's going to be a latent image. There is change that's taking place in you that nobody else will see for a while. The Holy Spirit keeps working, and that image that's happening on the inside, actually, over time, it's going to become a visible image. What I mean is by that is people won't know what they're looking at, but there is going to be a some version of a visible transformation to anybody that's honest, that you, you now are led by the Spirit of God. Spirit transforms us. How does it work? You know, I, I had a guy ask me one time, well, how does this work? And basically he's saying, if you can't tell me how it works, then I'm calling baloney on it. And this guy is a Christian. He's saying there's no difference between Old Testament greats and New Testament greats. Expectation was the same, same thing. You just got to do it. Well, I will pause here and enter. How many of you tried to do this and found you need a little bit of help? Anybody? How many of those Old Testament people tried to do it and we can read exactly the way that this plays out? They needed, they needed some help. I don't know exactly how the Spirit does it, but the scripture says he transforms us in the inner man. That's his work. I'm, that is a supernatural power that you will not get anywhere other than the indwelling spirit. Very thankful for that. Spirit strengthens us. Spirit's a helper. I mentioned this earlier. John chapter 14. A few things I want you to, to consider today in big pictures, we're going through this. One is you don't have to do this on your own. Spirit gives us true help. The second is don't skip your part. You got to do your part. And the third is, brethren, our faith, if there is one limitation, it's my faith. Do I believe what God... I believe what God says. Does this work? Yeah, it works. First of all, God says it. Secondly, if you actually are participating in this, you're going through this process, and there starts getting to be some proven character along. This works. But you got to do it. The latent image. God's doing it from the inside out. That latent image first, before it becomes visible. Stick with it. Believe him. Do it. And you don't have to do it by yourself. John 14, verse 16. I will ask the Father... And he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not behold him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Two things real quick. First of all, Jesus promised a helper. One called alongside to help. You don't have to do this on your own. 
Got somebody working with you. Got your, got your true life coach. Not just life coach, actually, the source of life okay, within us. So the second thing just to notice from this is that spirit is the spirit of Christ. You, he, Jesus is telling the apostles, you already know this guy? Because he lives with you and he will be in you. Now, I also bring up verse 23 because some people try to say, well, that was only a promise to the apostles. There's some specific things about the helper that are particular to the apostles. But verse 23 is clear. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. Any Christian is going to have the indwelling spirit. Okay? We have the helper. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. 12, verse 12, what, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Okay. Ask yourself, am I doing that? Okay. Not your neighbors, not the person in front of you, not the person behind you. Are you working out your salvation with fear and trembling? A little bit of pressure there in case you don't catch it. Fear and trembling. But, but you're not by yourself. Verse 13, it is God who is at work in you. Both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Aren't you thankful for the helper? Hey, you take this on. God will help you. That's his promise. It's a guarantee. He strengthens us. We're strengthened through his spirit in the inner man. Andrew did a quick five-minuter last Lord's Day night. It was awesome. And I know Andrew's been doing some, a bunch of work on the inner man. I'm going to, if you have questions about the inner man, I'll direct you a little bit to Andrew. He's doing some great stuff on that. But I want you to notice here, we are strengthened through Christ's spirit in the inner man. Because it's one thing to be new. Being new is great. Being new is cute. Being new is, but somewhere, being new has got to get strong too, right? So the fact that we're renewed daily, I'm thankful for the spirit, but God doesn't, he doesn't leave us as infants. He wants us to grow and to be strong. The Spirit does His work in strengthening us as well. The Spirit also helps us crucify the flesh. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. You know, Jesus says, deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. You ever notice something? The flesh wants what the flesh wants. The flesh will push you. The flesh will fight against you every step out of the way. You need to get up at 5.30 this morning to pray? What's the flesh going to opt for? You know, if I don't, I couldn't get to sleep last night. If I don't get that extra half hour, I'm not going to, like this day is going to be a, you know, the, what I'm, you know what I'm saying, right? The flesh wants what the flesh wants. It's going to fight you. Well, Galatians chapter 5, I like this. Verse 16, I say, walk by the Spirit. You will not carry out the desire of the flesh. The flesh sets its desire against the Spirit. Oh, but the Spirit sets its desire against the flesh. Who's stronger? You listen to all the so-called Christian music out there? They're going to tell you, yeah, the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weaker. Do I, am I kidding you? Isn't that what we're told everywhere in this so-called Christian world? Hey, what, what's the scriptural proof, though? Who's stronger, the flesh or the spirit? The spirit is. These are in opposition to one another, so you may not do the things you place, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. How many ever? You know, here, here's the problem with these things. These are the kind, they're, they're like ice cream. You eat a little bit, and there's no satisfaction and they end up eating you alive. The flesh will kill you. Now, the spirit, the fruit of the spirit, did I finish verse 21? Which, I want to finish verse 21, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. 
God doesn't make exceptions. If the mindset on the flesh is death. If you are practicing the, the deeds of the body, you will die. That is a scriptural guarantee. So if you've got some of these things in your life, you ought to take them on. Now, again, let me rewind the tape. You don't have to take them on on your own. Thankful for that. But you've got to be serious about this. Take them on with the help of the Spirit. Verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. I've got to fast forward this. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Who, who's the source of our life? The Spirit. If we get life from the Spirit, then we should walk by the Spirit. He's willing to help us do that. He helps us to crucify that flesh. I mean, the cru crucifixion is a tough ordeal. We need help. Spirit helps us. Spirit gives life. I've got to fast forward this part. I do like the second wind. Numos. Any of you ever? <sighs> Spirit gives us second wind. He's the Numos. Jesus said to ask. You know, in, in John 4.10, Jesus said, if you knew who it was who said to you, you would ask. And I, he would give you living water. Luke chapter 11, verse 13. The Father will give the Holy Spirit to anyone who asks him. How, well, how does that asking take place? I'm just going to say this. As a parent, do you ever want your kids to ask in a certain way? Is there a certain way that you expect your children to ask? Are all askings equal? No. Is it reasonable that God would want us to ask in a certain way? He's not arbitrary. So he tells us how to ask. Now, I don't even come close to have time to preach on that day. He knows what he's doing. Okay? So the way we ask, we ask in the waters of immersion. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. What shall we do? Peter said, repent and let each of you be immersed in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Spirit. I had a study with a guy in the Philippines who's now a Christian, by the way. It took him a long time. Uh, Brother Wilson. They called him Brother Wilson. That's a cultural thing, long before he was my brother in Christ. But we, we're having this discussion. He's basically like, I'm a good, he's a good guy. He would be, I would say, comparable to the Good Samaritan, the way that he lived his life. Very good guy. So basically... Why can't I have the Spirit? I just made a simple point. The Spirit's a gift. You don't earn the Spirit. You give. That's gift by God. But there is a certain way. When you do this, when you're immersed in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you shall receive the gift of the Spirit. You receive. God gifts. Acts chapter 5, verse 32. So is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. Our appeals in the waters of immersion. You can check that out, Acts 22, 16, 1 Peter 3, 21. If you don't ask God's way, you're never going to get the Spirit, and you are destined for that death, that death that's inside. It's just slowly sucking the life out of you. You're destined for that for eternity. So will you ask? Closing. I know we know it. I just want to think about it again. The Holy Spirit, what an amazing gift. What better could God have given than to come and dwell within me? I don't know what else you could do. What better? I mean, he couldn't. That's the best thing he could possibly give. He renews us. He transforms us. He strengthens us. He helps us to crucify the flesh. He gives us life and a lot more that we didn't have time to get into today. Be immersed. If you haven't been immersed, ask. Scripturally, be immersed into Christ. Oh, and if you've been immersed into Christ, be renewed. Walk by the Spirit.